finally, any decisions that are made that compromise that use of those part of the process require a process with the highest levels of openness, diligence, and foresight possible. And the agency is going to take an action that's going to somehow compromise this part of the process. Because this is being recorded, I just maybe half a minute to introduce myself in case anybody is just watching this afterwards. My name is John Shoyer. I was born and raised on the island of Oahu. My parents moved to Hawaii in 1950. Um, and I'm the youngest of four children. I've had the incredible honor and pleasure of living and working in Hawaii for my professional life, including particularly in the Native Hawaiian community. And I'm about to finish eight years of um, service to Hawaii on boards and commissions, three years on the Oahu Island Burial Council, and now eight years on the LUC with the fourth, in the fourth year as chair, and it's been an incredible honor. So the four points that I said I want to get to, first is there's three independent legal origins of the public trust in Hawaii. So I want to talk about each of those and why it matters that there's three separate independent origins of the trust. Then I want to talk secondly about how our understanding of the public trust has evolved a bit, particularly by using water as an example of how our understanding of water has evolved over the years. Third, just briefly go over some key guidance from the courts to boards and commissions on how they should manage their public trust duties. And finally, just some personal observations and thoughts about the challenges ahead for the Land Use Commission and other boards and commissions that have this cooling. This picture is a picture of um, Emperor Justinian, um, a Roman emperor who actually codified Roman law. So um, the first origin of the public trust doctrine in Hawaii, um, and this is not a priority order, but comes to us from Roman law through English and American common law into Hawaii law. We have an independent origin in Hawaii kingdom law. And then we also have particular state constitutional provisions that set up the public trust doctrine. So first, how did the public trust arise in Roman law make its way into English law and American common law and all the way to Hawaii? And there's just a brief preface. Um, there are people in this room who know more about these particular things and who are actually trained attorneys um, more than I am. Hopefully the point of this talk will be more of a synthesis of a bunch of disparate things that bring them together rather than trying to say, oh, I know all about any particular thing in depth. All of these issues that I raise have books and legal articles um, and lots of scholarship and um, legal rulings around them. So I'm just trying to take us an overview of them to see how they all fit together. So how did this come to way? Um, Often legal scholars attribute um, the first legal incorporation of the public trust doctrine into the Justinian code. Um, Emperor Justinian, it, when he codified and, um, Roman law, one of the provisions was by the nature, law of nature. These things are common to mankind, the air, running water, the sea, and the, consequently the shores of the sea. No one therefore is forbidden to approach the seashore, provided that he respects the habitation monuments and buildings which are not like the sea subject only to the law of nations. In other words, there's some resources that everybody needs for their existence that's so important, it does not make sense for there to be private property. In them. Um, jumping ahead a few hundred years with the Roman occupation of Britain, this makes its way eventually into the first bits of English. Um, common law. And in the Magna Carta in 1215, one of the, um, there's an interesting practice of putting fish traps and fish weirs in various streams around um, Britain in order to capture fish, but this impeded navigation of those very streams. And so one of the provisions had fought over by the Magna Carta and imposed on the crown is that all fish weirs shall be removed from the Thames, the Medway, and throughout the whole of England, except on the seacoast. In other words, even though these private lords had certain rights to go fishing and to gather fish from these streams, there was this underlying idea that something is so public, the ability of the public to transverse these streams, that this could actually be, um, these private practices could be removed in respect of the public trust practices. Ignoring a very long and complex history of American um, jurisprudence on this, um, 
One case that gets cited all the time is the case of the Illinois Central Railroad versus the state of Illinois. Early on, the legislature of Illinois granted a huge grant of coastal lands um, to the Illinois Central Railroad, saying, here, we're giving these to you um, in the city of Chicago for the development of port and railroad facilities. And then later, they tried to take some of them back. And what the court essentially ruled, the US Supreme Court, was that the original grant was invalid because the state, even the legislature, didn't have that ability to simply wholesale give away the public trust interest in that coastal area to a private entity. Um, and the court ruled it's the settled law of this country that lands covered by tide waters belong to the respective states as a consequent right to use or dispose of any portion whereof when that can be done without substantial impairment of the interests of the public in the waters and subject always to the paramount right of Congress to control the navigation. And in 1892, the year before the overthrow, um, the legislature of Hawaii expressly adopted English common law to be the law of part of the law of Hawaii. And this survives to this day as Hawaii Revised Statutes, chapter one, section one, the common law of England is ascertained by the English and American decisions is declared to be the common law of the state of Hawaii in all cases, except as otherwise professed, expressly provided by the constitution of the laws of the US, the laws of the state or fixed by Hawaiian judicial precedent or established by Hawaiian usage. So how do we get from Emperor Justinian all the way to Hawaii? That's how. Second, how did the public trust arise in Hawaiian kingdom law? So um, right in various traditions, um, Hawaii and Hawaiians and all the things in Hawaii are genealogically related to each other. Um, in the tradition around the origin of Kalo or Taro, Papa and Wakea had a first child, Ho, Hoku Kalani, who was stillborn. Um, the parents buried that child. Um, and in the spot where the child was buried from that spot, the first Kalo plant grew. Um, they had a second child, which was Haloa, or the first human. That legend speaks to many things, including um, the duty of humans as the younger sibling of Kalo to take care of it, but also points to, which appears throughout Hawaiian mythology, the idea that what we now call resources are actually physical embodiments of the gods. Um, they are um, deities with whom we share the world and with whom our leaders help manage those resources, but not as their own private property, but really for everybody's benefit. And I have two long quotes. I wanted to include this because um, Commissioner Okuda, um, during our conversation yesterday, mentioned knowing uh, Kavena Pukui as a child. Um, and there's a quote from Handy and Handy and Pukui's um, book, Native Planters in Old Hawaii, where they specifically talk about this. Um, it's a long quote. I put it on two slides, but um, Pukui says, writes, an alienable title to water rights in relation to land use, um, so it should say was, a conception that had no place in the Hawaiian way of thinking. Water, whether for irrigation, for drinking, or other domestic purposes, was something that belonged, in quotes, to Kanei Kabaiola, procurator of the water of life, and came through the meteorological agency of Lono Makua, the rain provider. The paramount chief born on the soil and hence first born of the Makainana of Amoku, an islander district was a medium in whom was vested the divine power and authority. But this investment was instrumental in providing only a channeling of power and authority, not a vested right. This was not equivalent to our European concept of divine right. The Ali Nui in old Hawaii thinking and pacifists did not exercise personal dominion, but channeled dominion. In other words, he was a trustee. The instances in which Noli Inui was rejected and even killed because of the abuse of his role on it are sufficient proof that it was not a personal authority, but trusteeship that established right or point. I didn't have to include the last sentence, but I thought it's a useful reminder to us as land use commissioners of what can happen if we make bad decisions. That legal understanding and really what was a religious as well as a legal understanding of the world was incorporated into the very first laws of the Kingdom of Hawaii. In the 1840 constitution, it states the land along with its resources, quote, was not the king's private property. It belonged to the chiefs and the people in common of whom the, chief, the king was the head and had the management of the landed property. So this idea that certain resources just were not 
privately held, but were really held as trust, was there. And then in the Kuleana Act in 1850, when the legislature and the king, right, witnessing massive depopulation of the islands, were trying to figure out what to do. And I, I don't have it in this um, slideshow, but I have, there was a great survey of missionaries in the 1840s across Hawaii that was done by the American Board of Foreign Missions. And one of the recurring themes that happens from the missionaries when they're asked, what's causing the depopulation of the islands and what do you think we can do is like, and quite a few of them is like, I think the problem is you don't have private property. Um, and it sounds a little egregious, but I'm actually not making that up. That's exactly what they say. And they say, you know, if we had private property and land, maybe Hawaiians would be more motivated to make money and improve their lot and they would survive and thrive there. And so partly with that sort of historical understanding, the legislature takes this monumental move to privatize some resources, some land, and some rights in land, um, rather than have it held in trust. But really clear exceptions are made, which we now understand to be including the traditional and customary rights of Native Hawaiians, which exist on all undeveloped private property, less than fully developed private property, as well as on water. And specifically in the Kuleana Act, the springs of water, running water, and rights of way shall be free to all on all lands, granted in fee simple, provided that it shall not be applicable to wells and water courses, which individuals had made for their own use. In other words, at that particular time, there wasn't like large scale commercial agriculture. It was like, if you had a house and you put a well on it, or if you had like a little stream diversion, we're not saying that we're taking that away from you, but otherwise, all this water, all these streams, all this groundwater are free to all. So that how, is how that comes into Hawaii law, that really ancient tradition of a public trust. Um, how did it arrive into the state constitution? There's some very specific provisions that were included in the 1978 Constitutional Convention, Article 11, Section 1, all public natural resources are held in trust by the state for the benefit of the people, unambiguous. We often hear before this board and before other boards and commissions, some people say, well, the public trust doctrine is a constitutional provision in a way. It is more than a constitutional provision, though it is absolutely in the constitution. In addition to that, in Article 11, Section 7, which creates calls for the creation of the water code. The state has an obligation to protect, control, and regulate the uses of Hawaii's water resources for the benefit of its people. And then also the traditional and customary rights of native Hawaiians, which are related to property rights are also included. The state reaffirms and shall protect all rights customarily and traditionally exercised for subsistence and cultural and religious purposes and possessed by Ahupua'a tenants or descendants of native Hawaiians who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands prior to 1778, subject to the right of the state to regulate such rights. And this is a report from the committee that recommended the final language of the provision that called for the creation of the water code. As they, the committee in the Constitutional Convention in 1978 reported to the whole body, why did we write it this way? They said, accordingly, your committee concluded the constitution should specify the state holds the water resources in trust with the responsibilities of a trustee to actively protect, control, and regulate the development of water resources in the state. This concept implies not only the power to protect the resources, but the responsibility to do so long before any crisis develops. So we're almost done with part one. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that we have three independent sources of the public trust in Hawaii? I'll give two particular examples. This is language directly from the Waiohole water case, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But direct quote from the Supreme Court, the code and its implementing agency, in this case, the Water Commission, do not override the pub public trust doctrine or render it superfluous. Even with the enactment of and future development of the water code, the doctrine continues to inform the code's interpretation, define its permissible outer limits and justify its existence. In other words, even if the legislature got rid of the water code or as Peter Young once proposed, devolved all the powers to the county, the public trust doctrine wouldn't go away because the law was changed. A more recent example, and I'm quoting the senior Senator from Hawaii um, and US Senator from Hawaii in February of 2020, right before the world imploded due to COVID, he and a number of other elected officials published a beat, an opinion piece in civil beat called um, something like coming together to solve Hawaii's housing crisis. And so in February 5th of 2020, no committees have met at the legislature yet, basically. And they say, oh, by the way, with input from the counties, laws will be changed 
to reduce regulatory barriers in the Land Use Commission and the Historic Preservation Division to accelerate housing development. Now, a lot of things happened the next month of March 2020, including the pandemic. But the point of my putting this up is that every year I've been on the Land Use Commission and every, every year before that, people try to get rid of the LUC in various ways or reduce our powers just because they might change the statute that governs the LUC does not get away from the state and the LUC's public trust responsibilities. It might make it much harder for us to render and fulfill those responsibilities, but it doesn't eliminate them because of these independent sources of law. Okay, one quarter done. And actually, I think that was the longest part. Um, just to illustrate a few more things, um, I wanna talk a little bit about how the public trust has evolved regarding water in Hawaii. And this is an area where um, I have um, practiced not as an attorney, but as an advocate in front of the Water Commission for about, it is approaching now, I believe, about a quarter century. Um, so this is crazy, right? But um, despite the fact that, um, oh, call my, the first constitution said, hey, all these public resources are held in trust. And despite the Kuleana Act that said water is to be held in trust, the plantations arise soon after. Sugar plantations, the large ranches, later pineapple. And there are stories in Hawaiian language newspapers from around Hawaii. This is one from the Vaiha, um, which because I don't have two screens, I'm not able to read the English language translation um, right in front of me, but basically it says, um, you know, hey, I'm reporting from Maui and all the natives in this area, they have no more poi. They're re forced to eat hard crackers, saloon pilots, hard crackers that, that hurt the mouth, but do not satisfy the hunger of the native Hawaiian people. So we start to go through this weird transition. The black letter law says, hey, it's a public trust. Nobody owns it. The king holds it in trust. The government holds it in trust for everybody's benefit, but people start to divert it. And then actually there's Supreme Court decisions, sometimes made by Supreme Court justices during the late kingdom and the Republic and the territory. Justices who are not just like, family members or friends with the plantation, but if we're actually stockholders in the plantations and they start to make all these decisions that treat water more and more like private property that can be bought and sold. Um, this is exacerbated, of course, with the overthrow in 1893, the subsequent Republic of Hawaii, and then the annexation of Hawaii to the United States. And this understanding, this evolved pub understanding that water in Hawaii, oh yeah, it is private property. It can be bought and sold. If you buy former Kala lands and you transfer that water to um, upland areas, that's okay. You can buy and sell those rights with other people. That continues in, until on this island, um, in the west side of this island in the early 1970s, a fight which had been going on for decades between the McBride plantation and the Gain Robinson plantation makes its way first to circuit court for a final adjudication of water rights to the Hanapepe River. Um, and the circuit court says, okay, here's how much McBride owns, here's how much um, Robinson owns. Hey, the state owns some land in this area. They also own this many gallons per day of rights to the Hanapepe River. Um, in a decision I'm sure they regretted, they appealed the decision to the Hawaii Supreme Court, which was now headed by Justice William S. Richardson, a native Hawaiian. Um, and they used that opportunity to overrule all of these previous decisions that had ignored um, the original laws in the state. And so one of the key points of the McBride decision, and this litigation goes on for you know 15 more years. So recognize there's complexities here, but the key in this decision is thus by the Mahele and the subsequent land commission's award and issuance of royal patents, the rights to water was not intended to be, could not be, and was not transferred to the awardee. And the ownership of water and natural water courses, streams and rivers remained in the people of Hawaii for their common good. So they kind of reset the clock and said, okay, you know what? It's not actually private property. There's this public trust that exists. So we understood as a public trust, kind of evolved away from that, but it's now been evolving towards a more traditional understanding again. And really, so those state constitutional provisions are put into place to clarify and put in place a method for managing this public trust resource. So the provision um, that all public natural resources are held in trust and the creation of the water code are response to the McBride decision. Um, 
it actually takes though nine years for the water code to be passed. Um, it, the constitutional amendments are adopted by Hawaii's voters in 1978, but not until 1987 is the code passed. And it's because people were beefing at the legislature, largely plantations and large landowner interests on one side and native Hawaiians and environmentalists on the other side over how this code should operate. And one of the biggest compromises in the code was the statement of a dual mandate. Um, and it's on a couple slides because it's a long provision. And the, they, they direct this new water commission, the state code shall be liberally interpreted to obtain maximum beneficial use of waters for the state for purposes such as domestic uses, aquaculture uses, irrigation, and other agriculture uses, power development, and commercial industrial uses. However, adequate provision shall be made for the protection of traditional and customary native Hawaiian rights, the protection and procreation of fish and wildlife, the maintenance of proper ecological balance and scenic beauty, and the preservation and enhancement of waters of the state for municipal uses, public recreation, public water supply, agriculture, and navigation. Such objectives are declared to be in the public interest. Um, so you got to do all of that all at the same time. <laughs> And one of the things that this and other compromises in the code did essentially was it made a huge space for judicial interpretation of what exactly does this mean? What is the right way to fulfill our public trust duties given this legal instrument, the water code? Um, and the first big modern case in water law in Hawaii since the code was passed was the Waiahole water case, which pit pitted um, windward farmers, a small neighborhood board, um, community associations um, against, and some environmental groups against uh, the big five, the US military and um, two state agencies. And when the Hawaii Supreme Court eventually ruled after a contested case proceeding in front of the Water Commission, this is not exhaustive. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Waiahole because I could drone on about it for a long, long time. But uh, some key findings, all water is held in trust in Hawaii without exception or distinction. So it's not just surface water, surface and ground. It's not just water on public property. It's water everywhere. Um, because one of the bizarre rulings from the courts during the territorial period was that somehow if you allowed water to flow Maokata Makai, it was wasted. They overruled that. And they said that obviously that has an important cultural and ecological use. They clarified very clearly the state is the trustee of the water resources trust. The precautionary principle applies. And so the Water Commission, one thing the Water Commission had done in their conclusions of law for the Waiahole case was they said they adopted this principle um, called the precautionary principle, which says that when scientific evidence is uncertain or unconclusive, the trustee still has an obligation to make a decision and to make the decision that is most likely to protect the resource. So you err on the side of protecting the resource. If like, I'm not sure if, if we're gonna take all this water out of a stream, is it gonna harm the stream or not? People in the Waiahole case were arguing like, well, yeah, you know, there's no proof that it's gonna harm the stream so you can take it. And so the commission actually said, actually the principle is to be precautionary. And the Supreme Court ratified that part of the commission's decision said that is correct. Um, and then they included language that has been included in many court decisions to this day is that there's a level of openness, openness, diligence, and foresight necessary for a state agency to include when making these kinds of decisions. So, see, I told you it was getting shorter. That was part two. Part three, and this is not exhaustive, and there's excellent training that can both be given by our own deputies, attorney general, as well as the training given by Kohuliao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law, as well as other training on what the duties are of boards and commissions that the courts have been to us. But I'm just gonna talk about a few cases, um, the Ka'upulehu or the Kapa'akai case, the Kauai Springs case from this island. Apologies for the my computer having flipped the Okina to an apostrophe. Mauna Kea, um, the recent Lanayans for Sensible Growth case, which some of us lived through, um, and a very recent case from March of this year um, regarding a PUC decision um, on the island of Maui, Public Utilities Commission. So um, in Kapa'akai Oka'aina, um, as I know most people in this room very well know, um, the Land Use Commission um, was approving a district boundary amendment in the Ka'upulehu area for the development of a resort hotel. Um, 
petitioners from the area, including those who gathered salt, hence the name Kapa'akai, um, were concerned about the impact of the development on their traditional and customary practices, including their crossing over the property, their ability to gather salt, to gather fish, and other items from the shoreline. The Land Use Commission accepted the finding from the petitioner that said, you know what, it's okay, we will work with these practitioners after, as the development commences, to protect their rights. And the, they, it was appealed, and the Hawaii Supreme Court said, first of all, you cannot delegate that. You can't hand that off to the developer. That is, as a public trust trustee, essentially, you have that duty to make sure you do certain things. And they laid out certain things. Um, and the three-part Kapa'akai test is to first identify the valued cultural, historical, or natural resources in the area and the extent to which traditional practices are exercised in relationship to them the extent to which the resources and rights will be affected or impaired by those resources, sorry for the typo, and the feasible action to be taken to protect those rights. Now, Professor Malia Okutagawa of the University of Hawaii at Manoa and a Molokai um, homesteader and leader has her um, pigeon version of this, um, which is what get, what going to happen, what you're going to do, which is a lot easier to remember as the three-part test. What is in the area? What's gonna happen if you approve this? What are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna mitigate it? And then the fourth part really is you cannot hand them off. You cannot say, hey developer, you go take care of this afterwards. You have this duty to do it. So um, certainly for the Land Use Commission, but also applying to the Water Commission, these Kapa'akai duties are part of how you fulfill your public trust duties and other boards and commissions. Now the Koi Springs case on this island as well was a very interesting case. There was a private water bottler um, who wanted to expand their facilities from an old plantation spring, and they were bottling water and selling it commercially around the island. Um, and they wanted to expand their operations, but they needed certain permits from the County Planning Commission. Now the County Planning Commission was like, and got some public testimony and they're like, huh, I think we might have some public trust duties here. Um, so they wrote to the Water Commission and they said, hey, Water Commission, how, how do we evaluate the impact on the resource from this bottling plant? And the Water Commission in a, I think it was a one or two page letter said, you know what, it's not a designated water management area. We don't issue any permits for it. So, you know, we can't help you here. The Planning Commission said, okay, then I guess we're doing it on our own because we really do think we have these duties. Um, and they said, on the basis of not having sufficient information from the applicant on the impact of the, on the public trust of this bottling operation, which would be expanded via these permits, they denied it. It went to the Hawaii Supreme Court and the Hawaii Supreme Court, Supreme Court actually upheld the Kauai County Planning Commission. Um, so there's, I'm gonna kind of whip through these. It's in three pages of the Supreme Court decision, but it's a really beautiful and thorough and clear step-by-step, -step, what do you gotta do? First of all, the agency, they're talking about um, the planning commission, but this really applies to whatever agency is making the decision. Their duty is to assure the water of our state are main, maintained as pure and put to reasonable and beneficial use. First thing you've got to do is the, is the proposed use consistent with the tr public trust purposes. Um, and the four public trust purposes that the, that the courts have laid out are water left in its natural state, water use in the exercise of traditional and customary native Hawaiian practices, the domestic needs of the general public, and water reserved for or used by DHHL. So those four uses, presumptively, yeah, you allow those. Uses other than those four, um, then you have to apply a higher level of scrutiny. Um, you have to take each proposal on a case-by-case -case basis, recognizing there's no vested rights to the use of water. If the requested use is not one of those public trust uses, is private or commercial, they have to apply the high level of scrutiny and they have to evaluate the proposed use under a reasonable and beneficial use standard. Reasonable frequently being described as, is it efficient and beneficial as in line with other county and state policies and priorities. And then they have to look at that versus other priorities. And finally, applicants, applicants, not the state, not the agency, the applicant have the burden to prove that their use should be allowed in light of the overall trust purposes. Um, 
applicants have to demonstrate their actual needs, not their desires, their actual needs, and why it's right to drain water from a public trust resource for a private commercial use. They have to demonstrate that there's no practicable alternative to what they're proposing. And if there is a reasonable allegation of harm against the public trust purposes, they have to do one of two things, either demonstrate there is no harm or that the right use there is harm but nevertheless, the use is reasonable and beneficial. And if that is the case, then they have to implement reasonable measures to mitigate both their individual impacts and their cumulative impacts on the resource, if the resource, if the use is going to be approved. Um, so key lessons from Kauai Springs. First, just don't say, oh yeah, you know, I'm not designated, we're not going to do anything. Like you can't walk away from your public trust duties, even if your laws and your practices aren't accustomed to dealing with them. Second, just a briefer version of what I just went over. First thing, is it a public trust use or not public trust use? If it's a non-public trust use, you gotta do a higher level of scrutiny. Is it reasonable and beneficial? Are you fulfilling actual needs? Are there is an absence of practical alternatives? And is there a reasonable allegation of public trust purposes? And I'll talk a little bit more about this later because the recent court cases dealt with this. Um, if the uses, are inconsistent, but they're reasonable and beneficial, you have to impose mitigation in order to not just that individual's impact, but the cumulative impacts on the proposed use, if you're gonna approve it. I'm not gonna talk about Mauna Kea with the great awareness and sensitivity that to my right is somebody who is deeply, deeply, deeply involved um, in the Mauna Kea case. Um, the biggest lesson, the biggest outcome that everybody remembers from the Mauna Kea case is that um, the, on Mauna Kea 1, the Board of Natural Resources approved the permit and then held a contested case. And they said, oh, Ole, you got to do it the other way. You got to actually have that high level of diligence and scrutiny prior to the decision making. There were a number of other um, very important findings in the concurring decision. Um, this long quote, um, basically expands on and interprets Kapa'akai test. Basically, you have an affirmative obligation to look um, to look at what's being proposed and what's in the area and how those proposed uses are going to be imp impact in order to protect, basically have a presumption in favor of protecting those uses. Um, This gets at what a reasonable allegation is when an individual of native Hawaiian descent asserts that traditionally exercised religious or gathering practice in an undeveloped or not fully developed area would be curtailed. The state or agency is obligated to address the adverse impact in its findings. Um, so the agency has to act as a fact finder to evaluate the evidence as a party and to fulfill this duty, to permit such findings to be made, the agency is obligated to conduct a contested case hearing before the legal rights of the parties are decided. So it really clarified, um, in my mind, at least in a way that had not been done before, that traditional and customary rights are property rights and people, because they're property rights, they're entitled to the due process of a contested case hearing, which is the vast majority of hearings that this commission does. And finally, they said the role of an agency is not to be a passive actor or neutral empire and its duties are not simply fulfilled by providing a level playing field, right? They have a duty as the trustee to take that active role in trying to protect these public trust resources and the uses associated with them. Um, and you can't hand it off. Um, this is the Paul White Basin on Lanai. Um, if you can see the little silver squiggle, it's very faint on the screen. That's a new predator-proof fence that um, they're putting in to protect an Uwa'u colony at the summit of Lanai Hale, which is really nice. Um, but so the Lines for Sensible Growth is this incredibly painful 30-year saga that the Land Use Commission went through um, over a 1990 docket where we approved water use for um, golf course use at Manila Bay and wrote a horribly worded condition, condition number 10, which meant different things to different people and, in my opinion, probably different things to the different commissioners who voted in favor of it at the time. And it's been litigated for three decades and finally a final Supreme Court decision came down in 2020 after a third contested case hearing in front of this body. Um, there was, and it's such a contentious case 
interestingly, there was a majority opinion, which was three members, but only as to the decision that the commission made. There was a two party consenting and um, non-concurring decision from two of the justices who said, who agreed with what we did and agreed with how we made the decision. And then there was one justice who disagreed with the entire decision. And so there were three separate opinions. Um, so just to give you quotes from a couple of them, um, one of the things that um, the majority opinion recognized was that the Land Use Commission found that no party had raised a reasonable allegation to harm against the public trust. So that one of the reasons, one of that triggers when you go through that steps is like, is there an allegation of harm? Um, we actually asked during the, the during the third hearing, I'm like, are you saying that there's harm to the resource? Oh, I'm not saying there's harm to the resource. Okay, so you're not saying that there's harm to the resource. You don't have to necessarily go through those extra steps. Um, and the um, concurring and dissenting opinion said, based on the record in this case, the resort has complied with the Water Commission requirements. Oh, that's it. Um, and condition 10 established to protect the public trust and no threat of harm to the public trust has been shown. So they at least agree to us with us in that degree that like, you have to at least show some reasonable allegation of harm before you start to go into those things. And then finally, a case just from this year in March of 22, there was a new solar project being um, proposed in Kihei, one of our favorite neighborhoods at the Land Use Commission. Um, and it was approved by the Public Utilities Commission and then was appealed to the Hawaii Supreme Court. Um, and just one of the key findings, it's, it's really a minor case in many ways, but one of the things they cited to Lanayans for sensible growth, and they, they gave a little bit of extra guidance on what a reasonable threat is. It doesn't mean that you have to prove that there's a threat. So to be really clear, like as has happened in cases we've talked about, like in um, um, Oluwalu, where an established native Hawaiian practitioner fisherman came and said, you know what? I'm super concerned that this development is gonna impact my traditional and customary practices in this area. Plus they never talked to me. Um, that probably constitutes a reasonable allegation of harm. You don't have to come in with studies or experts to say that there's a reasonable allegation of harm, but all oh, that the parties in this particular case said, well, we think there's harm. And so it's, a, it's probably in my mind, similar to the way we treat standing. Standing is not always granted to a party, but it is liberally granted. So somebody makes an allegation of harm, unless it's just completely off, you take it as a reasonable allegation of harm, so. Last part, what are some of the challenges ahead? Um, four things I wanna talk about as we try and navigate this already complex dynamic of fulfilling our duties and protecting the public trust while doing so. We're dealing with climate change, changing demographics in Hawaii, changing community standards, and the challenges around coordination and cooperation among state agents, federal agencies, and the counties. Questions that I don't necessarily have answers to. But so you have these duties to protect traditional and customary practices and public trust interest. How do we protect a shoreline that's going to be inundated? The shoreline that we're protecting and we're making decisions about will be in a different place in 50 years, 20 years maybe, definitely in 100 years, sometimes 10 years perhaps, if with erosion. We set aside important agricultural land quite a bit of it, it's on an old plantation model, may not have water available to it. That's a clear um, consensus provision of climate scientists. We set aside and we protect areas from development, so to protect cultural resources, but what if this area just by climate change alone is gonna change in such a way that those resources aren't going to exist? We also have changing demographics in Hawaii, which sometimes we are blamed as being the cause of. If you look at statistics for Hawaii's population change in the last few years, um, and consistently in some ways over the last decades, um, in the last few years, our population has been shrinking, not growing. But also people born and raised here are moving away and people from elsewhere are moving in. So, there's natural replacement as um, those who are older among us pass away and young people are born, but there's also this demographic change that's happening. 
the accusation against the land use commission is that we're too tight on protecting resources and not putting land into the urban district and that drives up housing prices and that's what's driving this change. Um, I actually disagree with that contention, but that change does, I disagree with that intention, contention for many reasons, including but particularly for the fact that because Hawaii is awesome, there is an endless supply of people who want to live in Hawaii at every price point, from our brothers and sisters who live on the streets to the 1% of the 1%. Um, and I don't think that there's an actual practical way you can build your way out of an endless demand and have any meaningful impact on prices. So there has to be another solution. How do we address that? And how do we deal with the impact that as the population of Hawaii changes, the people who fought in some cases for like their entire lives to like have some say over water in their communities or have some say over where the shoreline goes or some say over the protection of resources. When they move away and new people move in, what do we do when that constituency changes that we're really, our job is to fulfill. At the same time, right, we have this reinvigoration around Hawaii that we've seen for the last now 40, 50 years, particularly in the native Hawaiian community, but throughout rural Hawaii, um, changing community standards. Um, we saw it at this commission in the Pulelehua case where people are like unwilling to accept affordable housing with the set percentages. They want way, way more. They're like, we're not willing to just build housing for the market. We want to make sure that housing is affordable to local people. And they also have very, very clear standards about what the level of community engagement should be. Don't just hold a hearing and say you're good, right? They want to really sit down with the people who are proposing these things and have meaningful, long-term, thoughtful, binding engagement. And what we've seen in Mauna Kea, in Honokohau, Maui, and Kavela Molokai on stream restoration, um, even over my lengthening but relatively brief lifetime, um, compromise was like, and why holy? Folks were stoked. Hey, we got half the water back, right? Half the water that was taken by this ditch system, we're getting back in our communities. In Kavela and Honokohau, they're like, no, we actually want 100% back. That's the level that we think the law requires, and that's the level that we need. Mauna Kea, despite Mauna Kea 1 and then Mauna Kea 2, what thousands of Kia'i made it clear was like, we actually have a standard that we're going to hold to on this mountain, which is we're not going to allow another telescope to be built. So when we sit in these boards and commissions, um, our processes in many ways were set up for times when we thought that there can be compromises where every side gets some and it's all good. And there's just this shift that's happening that I'm seeing across Hawaii where there's at least some folks who are like, yeah, our idea of compromise is maybe we'll let you keep a little bit for what you basically need, the rest we get back. Finally, coordination and cooperation. Um, I talked a little bit about the Water Commission. Um, they only fully fulfill their public trust duties in many ways in designated water management areas. In other places, they don't have the administrative tools to do so. This impacts us because when they come to somebody comes to us with a land use district boundary train and their full analysis of impacts on water are, well, you know, the sustainable yield is 10 and we're only using eight, we're all good. Um, we lack our support from our sister agency to really know whether the decision we're making, which will actually create that water demand, is going to fully protect public interest in water. Um, in our Kanaheli case, which is up to the Supreme Court, um, our sister agency, the Board of Land Natural Resources, which you know deals with their own incredible docket and their incredibly tough decisions, um, but you know. We have a hospital in the conservation district. We have lots of telescopes in the con conservation district. The number of conservation district use permits that are issued um, for things that don't typically fit people's general idea of conservation can set up both possibilities for collaboration, but as well as conflict between our commissions. And the counties, um, as this commission has been really clear on during my eight years, um, we no longer see special permits, at least I, I believe we've said this clearly, as the way to permit landfills. 
that it's a permanent change. It needs to go through a district boundary amendment process. But if that happens at the county level and they're like, oh yeah, special permits are fine, we end up in this sort of endless loop of going back and forth between the county and um, us on these special use permits things. So there's opportunities for collaboration and cooperation, but there's also tremendous opportunities for disconnect as we all try to collectively navigate through these obligations under the public trust. And just to highlight the language in um, the Mauna Kea case and, and reflect a little bit on my practice in front of the Water Commission, a lot of water commissioners are like, oh, we don't like contested cases. It's so formal, it's so tough. You know, I don't get to just talk story with the parties. But what I've seen on this commission is that because contested cases are a default, people have rights. They get heard. And many times people have come to us and they're like, I didn't like your decision, but I felt it was fair, right? I've had developers come to us who we've denied and say, yeah, you know what? I get it. I've had community members come to us who we've denied and they're like, yeah, you know, oh, I wish you had stuck it to them, but like, I get it. You guys made it real decision and we felt heard. So I think that process, that quasi judicial process really is one of the ways that we go forward. And the more that BLNR, the Water Commission, the counties adopt that as a default process rather than as an occasional process, we'll start to move a little better. Um, what are the implications and conclusions of all of this? First of all, reiterating the public trust doctrine exists beyond potential legislative changes. Just if legislature X changes something about it, it's not gonna get rid of these responsibilities that exist. Our understanding continues to evolve and the direction it's evolving in is that the trust is pretty expansive and the duties are pretty clear. The constraints on the public trust doctrine, like you need to make a reasonable allegation of harm exist, but they're fairly small. The duties on the trustees, us who make these decisions are pretty clear on what the standards are that we're supposed to follow. And these emerging changes around climate, around changing demographics, around changing community standards and our ability to cooperate and collaborate with our sister agencies are going to make life even more challenging. That's it, Paul, mahalo. Happy to have a good discussion. I'll stop sharing screen now. Uh, do folks want to take a recess before we go into it? Yes. I went a while. Let's take a 10 minute recess. It is 9.53 a.m. We, we, we will reconvene at 10.03. Sure. <laughs> it's 10.04. I don't feel like my mic is on. It's 10.04. Um, I neglected to ask for public testimony and I understand that um, Council Member Felicia Cowden would like to provide public testimony on today's agenda item. Um, I think you've testified before, so I'm going to swear you in, and then you can state your name and address for the record and yeah, testify. Yeah. Um, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth? I do. Okay. Please state your name and address for the record, and then um, see. Felicia Cowden, 4191 Kilauea Road, Kilauea, Hawaii. I just wanted to make a simple statement of appreciation and gratitude for both Jonathan's time as chair and for the Land Use Commission. As a county council member, I have confidence in your organization. I feel relieved when things are gonna be going before the Land Use Commission. I have focused more in the past four years, though I have participated for a couple of decades, but this group has done a particularly extraordinary job. Um, I'm very confident in Dan, our, um, our own person um, from Kauai, our member, but I have very much valued what you just shared for the um, public trust doctrine. And I thank the group for really giving that focus because it is so important. Uh, I just can't even state how important it is to have your organization do the kind of robust review of what, what happens to, to keep our land and water in good shape. We need it to continue. I, I get a little discouraged if I'm hearing it might be a threat. So um, thank you. Just want to say that and great job. Great job, Jonathan. Thank you very much, council member. Um, commissioners, are there any questions for the witness? 
Mahalo Nui for your testimony. Um, I think now the commission will enter into discussions and questions. Commissioner Okuda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, can't keep my mouth shut. I thought this was an excellent presentation. If I can just make a couple of observations. I think the importance of this presentation is, and this is not to say we should ignore what we hear at seminars by other people who might be more learned than us or anything like that. But I think the importance of this presentation is to show that the public trust doctrine in Hawaii has a, a legal and historical basis, as you pointed out, separate from the public trust doctrine as it is uh, laid out uh, in federal or state cases on the mainland. And it really comes down in my view to the fact that historically and legally, the source of, of land title in Hawaii is historically different. And uh, if I can just spend a minute, you know, this is not a revolutionary uh, Hawaiian legal theory or anything like that, because look, in my view, the queen was wrongfully overthrown in 1893 by American business interests. But the overthrow of the queen, I believe, did nothing to change the, the legal system in Hawaii, because before the overthrow of the queen, it's basically an American common law system, common law being judge made rules. Okay, and after the overthrow, it continued being an American common law based system. And Deputy AG Chow can correct me, but you know, in the American common law real property system, you only get what your grantor gave you. In other words, if I own, if I, I can write a deed and I used this example once in a quiet title case. I can write a deed saying, I, Gary Okuda, conveyed to Jonathan Scheuer all, all my right title and interest in Iolani Palace. And that deed can be recorded at the Bureau of Conveyance. And, uh, but does Jonathan get Iolani Palace? No, because I didn't own Iolani Palace. So the real question on a lot of land title issues in Hawaii and the rights that people have is, what was the original source of title and what did people get from the original source of title? And the original source of title is Kamehameha III through the process of the Mahele. And I asked this question of one expert lawyer who oftentimes appears in front of us who was giving a presentation at one of the uh, 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 planning officers, I think, convention where he tried to show, oh, look at these federal court cases regarding uh, water rights, uh, mainly from the mainland. Look at how the land, the, the public trust doctrine is applied on the mainland. And then he kind of like tried to bootstrap it saying, well, because of these recent US Supreme Court cases, maybe you can relitigate ownership of water in Hawaii. And my question to him was, well, the real question is, what did the king convey out at the original time of the Mahele. And my question to him was, what is the evidence in the historic record that the king intended to convey ownership of water? And even he had to admit, there's no evidence of that. And so what the king didn't convey out is retained by the king, retained by the successors to the king, which is the state of Hawaii. And because the constitution basically says, that uh, the sovereignty or the power of the state derives from its people, it's reserved back to the citizens of the state of Hawaii. So my only point is the fact that, um, you know, uh, as you point out, Chair, a lot of this, as far as the duties we have and what people claim they own, and just because you claim you own something doesn't mean you own it, we have to look back and see historically what property rights were in fact given out. Or as I told this guy, yeah, it's true. The plantations, when you look at these older Supreme Court cases, the cases look like the plantations say they own the, the water, but just because somebody says they own it doesn't mean they own it. It's what did the king actually convey out this? And again, it's not a radical proposition, this is a simple English American common law 
rule, which is you only get what your grantor gives you. And if your grantor never gave you, you don't get it. Um, one more point. Um, and I don't think our trust duties end with just the decision we make. Sometimes we have to defend our decision. Okay. And I, I don't want to you know, get people pissed off about their politics. So I won't talk about, you know, recent events in other areas where people sometimes do the long term, long range uh, thing, which is, okay, we'll fight the issue over this long term because in the end, we'll get what we want, even if the law might be different. But sometimes I think, you know, we got to defend our decisions in the courts. If we make a decision that we believe is the proper exercise of our public trust obligations. And I think one of our public trust oblig obligations is the protection of agricultural land for bona fide agricultural uses. You know, we gotta be willing to defend that, you know, through the appellate court system. We really do. Because if we just make a decision and we don't defend our decision or we don't defend what we think is the proper exercise of the public trust, then essentially it's like we, we never made the decision because the other side will, is gonna take the long view. They're gonna appeal it, appeal it, or they're gonna you know, just chip away at whatever we do. And in the end, you get, you know, you get the results. So I don't believe our public trust duties and when we just make the decision, we have to be ready to defend that decision in the court system. And maybe sometimes we got to defend it publicly because, you know, I think, Chair, you raised it yesterday, even though, you know, at, at the ending part of the meeting. Um, yeah, we got to really ask the question, where are we going to be in Hawaii 30 to 50 years from now? And what do we have to do so our kids don't feel like they can't live here anymore because there's no future. So that's just my comment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Okada. Commissioner Ohigashi. You know, I, I'm just kind of interested uh, when I look at the climate here, talk about climate change and its effect. Where do you see the, the litigation going forward or the, the problems going forward uh, in terms of utilizing the Public trust document, doctrine and issues of climate change. Yeah, you know, it's microphone. Yeah. What do I see the with climate change happening? What direction? Um, You know, I only have like the, the hints and preliminary thoughts and possibly entirely incorrect responses to where it might go. Um, you know, the, we dealt with something that I think we were really clear with as a commission, a disastrous attempt by OPSD to do a so-called five-year boundary review, which was instead an attempt to gut the commission's powers and hand it over to the counties. Um, the five-year boundary review should probably be looking at where our shorelines are going to be and explicitly like trying to put particular at least policies in place um, for how we deal with that. Um, I mean, what is it going to mean when somebody like, yeah, I own a parcel, it's underwater, but it's in the urban district, um, you know, brighter and more thoughtful minds than me, which means you guys um, will have to deal with that. Um, we have a real, real problem. There is already more land zoned, for instance, on Maui, than we actually have ready water available to deliver to it in the, ur in the existing urban district. Um, climate change is gonna exacerbate that. Um, what provisions does this commission have um, to enforce its decisions. I think a, a, a more robust and nuanced set of enforcement powers beyond um, simply <laughs> reversion would help us deal with some of the things that come out, a better policy toolbox. 
And in terms of the public trust doctrine, um, public trust doctrine, particularly as the um, precautionary principle applies to it, um, I think this commission has made a really great step in implementing recent statutory changes and requiring that sea level rise and carbon footprint be put into our district boundary amendment analyses. But we're at the very start of that process. And I think the level of analysis that we should be looking for, while it's difficult, um, we should really push for a very, very robust um, sort of set of um, things to be examined so that we're not putting things in, into harm's way. I don't know if that's fully responsive, Commissioner, to your question, but. I understand it might be responsive. <laughs> Commissioner Giovanni. A couple things, but I want to start by asking my fellow Commissioner Okuda, if I may, to expand to someone like me who does not have a legal training that you do. When you say we must consider appealing to defend our decisions, who, who is the we in that? And how does that work? Thank you, Commissioner. When I use the word we, I, I meant land use commission. Okay, I, 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 we're not, we're just human beings. So we're not perfect. And, you know, we have our disagreements and we, we definitely can make errors. And, and uh, you know, the, and this, the, system, the legal system is set up to basically correct those errors if we make it. Uh, and, and I think, you know, whatever uh, errors we make, uh, you know, I, I don't see on this commission that it's bad faith errors, like somebody was being bribed or someone's trying to help their friend or anything like that. Uh, it, it's not the kind of errors that, you know, are documented in what, Gavin Dawes book land and power in Hawaii or anything like that. Um, but when I say use the word we about defending it, okay, you know, the legal system, it's human beings. Judges aren't, you know, omnipotent or 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 smarter than any of us. And people sometimes view things differently. Um, if it's a situation where we make a decision, when I say we, and for some reason, a decision is overturned at the next step. My point was we, as the Land Use Commission, uh, um, should, if it's an appropriate case that we, we consider appropriate, um, we should insist that the decision be defended against at the next step, okay? Because as the chair pointed out, when you look at the significant landmark cases which protect the public trust doctrine in Hawaii, these are Supreme Court cases. These are cases where somebody lost at a lower level, but said it's important for purposes, and I don't want to say just public policy, I really think it's for purposes of future generations of determining what kind of community we're gonna have in the future, that we gotta go and take it to the highest level to make sure that the highest level sets the policy that's gonna be followed statewide. I'm really concerned when, for example, and we can get into it at some other hearing when it's properly agendized, but as a general principle, you know, I'm just a little bit concerned when a single circuit judge is going to make a decision which sets statewide public policy, because if we don't go and and appeal that decision, you know, it it becomes now uh, something that's paraded around at other hearings saying, look, look, look. This is the con this is the decision overturning land use commission. Yeah, it's only a circuit judge, but hey, you know that yeah, it's it's precedent or it's persuasive. And look, I've been guilty of that too in the court. I'll find some something that says the other party is wrong, and I'll parade that around even if it's just a circuit court decision. So you know, if the Hawaii Supreme Court 
or the Intermediate Court of Appeal says something and the Hawaii Supreme Court won't take certiorari on it, in other words, leaves the decision standing. If it's the highest appellate court says, hey, Land Use Commission, you're wrong, this is the rules, okay. You know, we're bound to follow that highest precedent and that's the rules and it's gonna apply statewide. But I think there's a real danger to democracy and to our public trust duties where we by default just let, you know, a lower level judge who we might all have the highest respect for, but make a decision that now is gonna have implications statewide. Yeah, none of us like to do appeals or what have you, but sometimes to, to really protect what we're trying to do, we gotta just go fight for it. I mean, I think that's, that's what the, the, the history of the chair explained in these cases. These cases didn't appear out of nowhere. Uh, and oh, wow, Supreme Court, the, the sky opened up, the beam of light came down, just like in that movie, The Verdict, and you know, justice is brought to the courtroom. That's not how it happened. It was because people said, you know, enough of this, we're going to fight for things. We're going to fight for future generations. And so that's what I'm saying. We got to be willing at all levels to fight to make sure that if a rule is set up or we're told this is the rule, for example, with regarding to permitted activities within an agricultural district, then it's from the highest level, highest level. Yeah. Sorry, Dad. And that was the answer to what did you mean by we? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very beautiful and eloquent answer. Actually, that's that's the answer I was looking for. Um, Chair, I want to thank you for your presentation today. I consider it a very informative yet very brief overview of the issues. And I look forward to uh, a visitation with you one on one, in which we can sit for a full day and you can educate me in, in, in some detail because I need it because it's so damn important, it really is. You know, these are, um, these are complex issues. They're often misunderstood and they're generally misunderstood by the public at large. And it really, under, in my mind, it really underscores the critical role that boards and commissions play in the protection of the public trust doctrine. It's incumbent on us as a land use commission to take it very seriously, understand it, and to breathe it, breathe life into it in every docket that comes before us, every petition that comes before us. It's 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 incumbent on us. It's 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 part of our job. And whether it be at the forefront in a contested case or in defending our decisions through some appellate process, uh, appeal process. It's serious stuff, and I really appreciate it. Um, I got another comment just because I want to emphasize what you said very briefly in your remarks just a moment ago about a limitation on on commission on our commission to actually stand behind and 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 make our decisions strong decisions. And that is enforcement. We are, our enforcement toolbox is pretty limited, very limited. And I feel that there's a number of problems with that. Number one, with our only recourse at our level being reversion, it's a, it's a pretty big and enormous step to take, especially if a development is already partially underway. Um, and that's a problem. We need other tools in our toolbox at our level. And I think it's also a um, contributing um, problem in our re relationships with county planning groups because we make an order and then we lean on the counties to enforce the conditions of that order. And that if I'm sitting at their end of the spectrum, looking at our conditions that we're placing on them, it's going to rub them the wrong way in many cases. We need a collaborative working relationship with the counties to get effective enforcement for conditions that are real and beneficial to everyone. And so 
this whole area of enforcement to me is one which I hopefully see some real development. So thank you, and I look forward to our conversation. Mahalo, um, Commissioner Giovanni. If I may, I wanted to add a further response to Commissioner Ohigashi, a point I forgot to include and wanted to raise. Um, it, it is a subtle but an important point, and I think we have seen this on this island as well as other islands in terms of the quality of the um, cultural impact assessments that we receive, some of which are um, cursory would be a generous compliment, um, some of which are really thoughtful and in-depth and meaningful engagement with practitioners. One of the challenges for developers and for the agencies is how do you get meaningful input about a proposed project um, when certain practices it is not culturally appropriate to disclose or to generally disclose and make available in a public document, certainly things around burials, but also around other resources. Um, and having sat on the developer side, if you will, seeking a lot of use permit for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, one of the things we did to ensure that when we talk to people about potential impacts of additional water use, we would get real answers was that the people we used to conduct those interviews were people who had lived at a minimum two decades on the island. Um, and so I don't know whether it is a legislative change or a possible policy or guideline change within our rules, but you're gonna get better answers on cultural impact assessments when they are done largely by people from that community. And then you're gonna get from Oahu based or continental based firms who are sending out letters saying, please tell me about your cultural practices. And when they don't get a response, conclude that there must be none. Um, so that's another, if that more thoughtful engagement could include some overlapping questions about do you see your practices changing in light of climate change? How are you addressing them now? How might this project limit or enhance your ability to address them in the future? I want to make a comment about what uh, Dan indicated. Uh, I, I agree that we need more, uh, that there's a enforcement deficit and difficult time getting to comply, but what I find it is that the difficulty, the most difficult ones are the, are the state and the counties. <laughs> and we put all the conditions on county, uh, on county landfills, expecting them to comply, and then they're going to come back and say, we're not complying, you know, or we put a, on a certain conditions on a school. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they, they come back and then the state tells us, well, you, we don't have to comply because we're going to give you a study. You know? So, I, you know, I, 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 enforcement is fine so, so long as part of that enforcement includes our own, <laughs> the people who uh, apparently appoint us. In. <laughs> uh, please, Commissioner Giovanni. Yeah, bra bravo, uh, Commissioner. <laughs> I mean, I've been here a couple of years now, and the entities that come before us that are the biggest culprits in, in are the counties and the state agencies that don't like our decisions or don't like our conditions and then choose to ignore them without consequence. It's, it's, it's evident. You can find it in whether it be landfills or schools. You can see it. <laughs> And I think even yesterday we had a testifier from a state agency saying we're objecting because we don't like your process. Um, <laughs> I was like, okay, well, sorry, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Chair, since uh, this is kind of a wide ranging discussion, and it's probably got, it doesn't directly touch upon the uh, the subject at hand with the public trust doctrine, but but almost every develop, significant development that comes before us and something that's front of mind with every politician and every civic leader are the traffic issues that we have uh, on all of our islands. And 
um, I have found a real, I mean, what spurred, spurs this comment here is that um, we're brought before us a traffic analysis on a project. And it's done by this one firm or another, usually without real touch in, in what's happening locally. We had a petition before us here and right nearby in Kapaha, and there was this elaborate traffic study done and, and, the, and the petitioner in the case spent a lot of money on it. But it was, you could talk to any resident of this island, including that lady right there, our, our, our council member. You don't need a traffic study from somebody in Dallas, Texas to tell you what the traffic's like pa, on mornings and afternoons. And so do you have any um, perspective that you can share on how, how this commission can address, can better address traffic and how it comes into play on our projects? I'm going to try and tie this to the public trust somehow um, for agenda purposes, <laughs> but um, so one of the benefits of being on the commission is getting to go to trainings, including with the National Planning Conference by the American Planning Association and particularly the Urban Land Institute. Um, and state law and state practice is to require TIARS traffic impact analysis reports. Um, I think that the somewhat inaccurate and blithe sentence retort to your question is TIARs tell us how cars are moving and we're not actually interested in how cars are moving we're interested in how people are moving and so the field of transportation analysis is evolving to not just require reports on traffic but reports on how people and goods are getting to their destinations or not that can actually give this commission the tools to understand what's happening, what would be meaningful improvement as a condition. Um, and I think Hawaii is years to decades beyond what some jurisdictions are doing to try and address those things, to really think about, right? We're not, we're not interested in moving cars fundamentally. We get in cars because we want to move, right? So how do we move? goods and people in a better way that will actually get us to better questions because certainly asking how cars move you're exactly correct we get technically perfect transport <laughs> traffic impact analysis reports that don't solve our fundamental problems commissioner, uh, commissioner and <laughs> executive officer um if, if i may for a moment uh kind of address that a little bit because this is part of the larger training that we give our commissioners when they come on. The problem with TIARs is that they're usually disclosure documents. And, you know, if you read the details and you really understand what they're saying, uh, when they say no impact, what they may be saying is it already stinks and this is just going to make it, it so it's, it's not going to make it any worse because it already stinks, you know. Um, and we have to look at them in light of the fact that they are disclosure documents. Um, and that's what makes public input so important. Um, and their public input can be used to help render a decision and can be used to cross-examine the daylights out of the, the expert witness you know, who prepared the TIAR. I, uh, in my past experience as you know, a consultant for developers and, and as you know, a, a public employee and working on planning projects and for various parts of government, you, TIARs are probably the least reliable documents that I, de I deal with. You can make them come out any way you want now. So um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's good that this commission is skeptical of TIARs. I think that public testimony is in many cases more important than the TIAR. That being said, and linking this back into the public trust doctrine discussion, one of the things that this commission faces is there is a constitutional requirement to protect agricultural land. And the way we've been dealing with housing is inconsistent with what most of the rest of the country is doing. And that is we promote sprawl. 
I mean, and we we shouldn't be doing that. I mean, that most of the rest of the country is dealing with its housing shortages by doing infill development, um, redevelopment in the urban core and things like that. And the benefit of that is that you you don't have traffic problems now. So one of the things that this commission may want to think about is saying no. You know, just saying no. So to promote development inside the urban core. And to that extent, I think that state policy has been at least in or in, in uh, the city and county of Hon Honolulu has been somewhat successful in that all of the recent development or the lion's share of the recent development is going on in Kaka'ako. I mean, whether or not that's the right kind of development is another issue, but, you know, yeah, yeah. so. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ordecker. Thank you, Chair. Um, given that this is a training um, device that we're going to be using for the future, um, a couple of things, if I, if I can be indulged, is um, I'd like to ask um, the chair a few questions about his presentation. And I'd also like to give the rest of the staff the opportunity to ask for ask questions and things like that, if, if, I, if you can indulge me for a few moments. No concerns from the commissioners. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I think would assist future um, commissioners is an understanding of besides water, what other things you feel fall within the public trust doctrine? Um, certainly all publicly owned natural resources. So anything that the state has title to, um, things that it doesn't have title to, but owns or controls essentially such as the, the near shore ocean, the sky, um, less tangible things like light and light pollution, noise and noise pollution. Um, and in addition, um, so I think it's, and this is where the, um, the, the constitutional series of cases on TNC practices is really critical. Um, and the whole series in particular that found that most private property in Hawaii is not like private property in the continent. So, um, because certain rights were never granted, they were exempted. Um, and so rights to access, rights to do traditional and customary practice and other things were never granted in fee simple. So they're not held right now by the fee simple owners. They don't have the right to exclude. And so those are essentially public trust resources that exist on private lands. Um, so it's where the courts have, I think, been evolving in a direction of sort of relying on these kind of separate lines of cases on water and land. Um, but um, they're starting to merge together. There's another constitutional provision about the right to a healthy environment that I think is going to start to merge into that too, that could get to issues of traffic as well. Um, I think my last response to that question is that um, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. Um, the doctrine really is expansive. And um, for instance, during the contested case hearing in Mauna Kea, um, you know, you had a private sector attorney saying, no, the public trust only exists applied to water. That's the only extent of it. And it's just like, it's just, it's so wrong. It's hard to express how wrong that stance is, that it clearly applies very, very broadly to a whole set of resources. So uh, Commissioner Ohigashi. What about endangered species or does it have to be endangered? Yeah. I, I believe it applies to flora and fauna as well, particularly fauna, given common law rulings about that, but yeah. On a more practical, from a more practical standpoint, um, what about runoff issues? I mean, this is the runoff issues. issues. How runoff does it issues. apply to runoff issues? This is the, this is the public truck trust doctrine analysis applied issues. So to the degree that, the, that runoff is going to be negatively impacting public trust resources along the coast, absolutely. Um, 
And this is right. I think we see often in Kapa'akaya analysis is that we see we receive as well as public trust analysis is people look at the, the four squares of the property. And they're like, oh yeah, there's nothing here. We're good. <laughs> they have to look at that property in its landscape and its offsite effects. Thank you. Um, I think some of the commissioners have already touched on some of the other questions that I had, but um, just two more intellectual sort of questions for you that, that really don't have an answer, but I just like to get your opinion on. Um, where do you see the public trust doctrine evolving towards? Okay. <laughs> um, So this is absolutely personal opinion here. That's all I'm asking for. <laughs> um, it is frightening when you actually understand it, in my opinion, how little power our local and state governments have over our own future. You even get elected governor and you find out that actually what's happening um, in international capital markets, the decisions of um, hedge funds and investment funds over resort, key resort and other properties, decisions being made by the US military command can turn your local plans and world upside down nearly immediately. And there's, once land is zoned in the urban district, um, we can't force somebody to run a resort if they don't make money on it. We can't um, force people to employ our local folks if it doesn't make economic sense. The public trust, which we are the trustees of, really is our most meaningful leverage for determining our own future. I think to a much greater degree than most people appreciate. Sure, you got land. If you don't got water, which we get to say who gets, you're not gonna to get to do what you want to do. And we can ask that the transaction be one where our people, our Hawaii Native Hawaiians benefit much more than we have. Um, that is probably an answer to where would I like to see the public trust doctrine evolve to more than where do I necessarily see it evolving to where I see it evolving to is um, a much broader application and increasing appreciation at levels of all at all levels of government that it is something that has to define their actions. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to twist your head a little bit here, but um, how do you think the public trust doctrine should be applied to climate change and sustainability issues that were, at least the ones we're presently dealing with? I, I feel I already sort of answered it with Commissioner Ohigashi's question, so do you want to expand a little bit? Well, okay, so we requ now require, our rules now require that um, applicants give us information with regard to the impact of their developments on climate and climate change issues and, and sustainability issues. Do you feel that, especially with regard to sustainability issues, that the public trust doctrine analysis should be applied to, to sustainability issues? Yes, <laughs> okay. I do. Um, Commissioner Giovanni. Yeah, one of my observations is that recently the environmental impact statements that have come been presented, um, they follow a form, standard format. And in the environmental assessment area, no surprise, climate change and sustainability is often overlooked because it wasn't in the form that they used, the template that they used three years ago. Is that a vehicle by which, I mean, is, is the environmental impact statement and, and the demands that this commission can make, for example, if it, as an accepting agency for an EIS, that it has to do proper diligence to those, those I, questions? I believe there are additional requirements that were recently enacted. So 
so we are going to see more meaningful explicitly, explicitly okay. considerations. Um, this is this is just reacting to um, these two questions. Um, but right on Oahu, we are dealing with the Red Hill water crisis, and because of the way our current water withdrawal system is designed. Um, the Honolulu Board of Water Supply took the present preemptive act of shutting down one well that provides 20% of water for urban Honolulu as well as some nearby wells so that they don't suck pollution towards it. This is a drought, but it is an engineering drought. We can put in additional wells in other areas right now to deal with that. But until those wells are in, the Honolulu Board of Water Supply has advised that there might be a temporary succession of issuing of, of new water meters. People are losing their shit. <laughs> um, for a temporary thing, which is not a fundamental thing, which isn't like we need this money and sites and drill wells, and we will actually get back to the level of water we can. Climate change will, because of two main things, right? The dry areas are just getting drier fundamentally, and precipitation is coming more in what are colloquially called these rain bombs, where they're not soaking into the ground. So recharge is reducing, even in areas where we're getting possibly even more water, not as much as going into the ground. So we are going to have less water available fundamentally. And this is going to be very clear on the leeward sides of all the major islands. If we can't handle right now politically a temporary pause, I have no idea how we are administratively, regulatory, or politically ready for our more fundamental limits, which are coming down the pike. I have a, one last question, um, I'm a bit self-serving, but year in, year out, we, as you mentioned, we fight with the legislature over <clears throat> the curtailment, at the very least, of Land Use Commission um, authority. And part of what we've argued in front of the legislature um, time and again is that the counties don't seem to be able to um, handle the public trust doctrine. Can you comment on that a little bit? Certainly the, the general lack of using contested case processes um, limits it. Um, I mean, there's awesome people at each county level, right? And great volunteers on planning commissions. Some of it is a matter of training. Some of it is a matter of um, administrative practice. Um, right, to, in a small group to air dirty laundry, what I have found is that publicly, every time these bills are introduced at the legislature, the county's like, yeah, yeah, we want those powers. Privately, whenever they get a real stinker of development, they're like, LEC, can you guys handle this? Because <laughs> it's too hard at the local level to fight against local interests with people you're that close to on a small county. Um, and so we are the bad cop. Um, and sometimes the bad cop is really helpful for addressing those public trust concerns. Um, I, I think, I mean, to the degree, you know, whether or not American democracy is working well is a very arguable question, but frequently cited as one of the things that makes it work reasonably well is the diffuseness of power. The same thing that makes it hard to get anything done also, um, has multiple checks and balances, and we are one of those checks. Thank you, Chair. Um, if, once again, you can indulge me, I, I'd like to ask whether any of our staff um, has any questions um, with regard to public trust doctrine. Mr. Derrickson. <laughs> Just... What would you tell the commission they should be looking at, try to make sure that it's on the record for that time to support you know, the public trust doctrine, due diligence, it's required. 
Commissioner Scott asked, just so it's clear on the audio recording, is what questions might I encourage the commission to ask to get make sure things get on the record to ensure that the public trust doctrine is um, um, addressed. Um, certainly, the questions around Kapa'akai and delving deeper than the, just what are the extent. Um, really questioning who their consultants are and what their experience and relevance is um, to a particular area. Um, so one part I struggled with in putting this presentation together is, um, you know, the Water Commission clearly has a standard in their statute and, and has been incorporated into all the rulings of the public trust doctrine that the proposed use of a public trust use source needs to be reasonable and beneficial for water. Um, we don't have that exact same standard. People can propose projects and they can be like in line with zoning, but they can kind of be like, at least sometimes to some of us, kind of stinkers of a project, right? That don't necessarily serve any local existing need. Um, I don't know where that evolution will or can go, um, but I think you're at the edges of the public trust doctrine, at least, by asking project proponents, why is this even good? Why do we need this? How does this improve public trust resources or at least not impact them and overall fulfill the goals of the state? It's a good question, which is why it's a tough one to answer. Um, fortunately, we have incredible commissioners who read all 3,000 pages of EAs and point out to testifiers such as Commissioner Okuda that what they just said a document says is not actually what a document says. Um, so that, that, um, that ability to, to be both kind and firm is really critical. Any other questions? Um, I, I wasn't sure. I think I said, yeah, quickly to Dan's like, hey, can you give a presentation on the public trust doctrine a couple of months ago? Um, so I hope it's of some service um, to everyone as you continue this work. Um, I want to thank you for this. You know, the, the reason why is sometimes on the commission we stay in our little silos, right? Uh, think of uh, the, public, the public trust doctrine. The stop. We think more trying to be more generalistic. You should have told me this earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, you shouldn't have slept through his last presentation. <laughs> well, to, to respond a little bit more to Scott's question, I, I did because I, in the course of writing my co-writing my book on water in West Maui, forced myself to understand how the state sets sustainable yields, and it's just frightening how much is assumed and not in my mind, just not really getting at core issues of public trust protection or even providing for future affordable housing for water or water for affordable housing. Um, I did give a talk to the Water Resources Research Seminar. It's about an hour long that summarizes all of this. Um, and it's on YouTube and that link is posted to the commissioner's checkpoint, also just available to the public on YouTube. And um, I, would, I would love if there were questions from future commissions about water when people come in with just really simple statements like, oh yeah, well, sustainable yield, everything's good. Um, among the things we should be frightened about is that 
the Water Commission set sustainable yields in their water resources protection plan. And they have a long discussion of how climate change is coming and how it's going to affect things. And then they say, and we set sustainable yields based on historic rainfall. So it's going to be a huge issue and we're not incorporating it into how we set sustainable yields. So when you see those documents come in front of you and they say, the analysis is, this is a sustainable yield. We're only using part of it. We're all good. Um, vigorous questioning, I think, would be in the public's interest. Um, Dan? Um, again, I want to th thank you, Jonathan, for sharing your wisdom. And I want to invite you as a citizen to, to the open mic for for public testimony on these issues as we go forward. Every single one. Every single <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Okuda. Uh, I'm only, only going to talk if I'm the last person. And if, <laughs> if uh, you can give me, I think since we're supposed to follow Robert's rules of procedure, this is a point of personal privilege. And I, I only state it here, I wish there was a bigger crowd, but I'm only stating it here because I might not be around because of some litigation matters for you know the final meeting that you will chair whenever that might be. And so I don't wanna take a chance that I'm not there where I can tell you this. Um, and uh, so I'd like to give a eulogy even though you're alive <laughs> at this point in time. And I hope like when I give eulogies, I don't, I don't cry uh, when, when I give it. But, um, you know, we, we talk about ancestors at many uh, of these hearings. And, you know, uh, I know about your father being one of those Richie boys, a German Jew who fled Hitler, came to the United States and, um, you know, put on an American uniform, was trained at Camp Ritchie, where some of the Nisei uh, MIS interpreters were also trained, went back to Germany um, as, a, as an interpreter and defeated Hitler and fascism. And, you know, the historic record is clear that a number of the Ritchie boy interpreters were captured by the German army and uh, were summarily executed. And so it frankly was not safe for a German Jew to put on an American uniform and go back to Germany. Um, I think your father is remembered as somebody who put the University of Hawaii chemistry department on the map. Uh, you've told other people like Commissioner Origashi who used to be a University of Hawaii region, how he mentored Joyce Tsunoda. Uh, what was her position in the end? Uh, Vice community Hawaii college, Hawaii. yeah, community colleges. You know, I mean, that might not seem like a big deal no, but it was a big deal then where, you know, Japanese women were supposed to keep quiet and become school teachers and, and a school teacher is an honorable profession. You know, my wife spent her career helping disabled kids. Um, but, you know, your, your father, he just was out of the, uh, out of the box re regarding that. Um, uh, so I, I think uh, having known you all these years, watch your service as chair. I think knowing you, I know what your political bent is on a lot of these things, but frankly, I don't think anybody could really tell the way you handled the, the hearings that it was even keel. And even like you pointed out, people who didn't like the decision at least came away with the feeling that it was fair and it was open-minded. So uh, this is the part I try not to cry, but uh, um, you know, uh, your father would be proud of you, Jonathan. <laughs> Sorry, and I probably call you my friend. I will cry for you. Um, So I still have a couple of hearings to go. I think it has been a tremendous honor and pleasure. And to the degree I've done things that have not been wrong, I applaud, right, I apologize, but to the degree that we have accomplished some, I think very meaningful, good decisions for the state, it has been because of the breadth of intelligence and heart of my fellow commissioners. And it is and will remain one of the greatest pleasures and accomplishments of my life. So thank you very, very much. I would like to adjourn.
If that's okay, is there any further business, Commissioner, uh, Mr. Ordenker? No, there is not, although I would like to say that we all share Commissioner Curtis' sentiments. We are thrilled that you've been here and we're very proud. I am very proud to call you a friend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Much aloha. We are adjourned. It's 11.01.